Um, can anyone hear me? Oh, yeah, really nice. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the National Museum of Singapore. And welcome to the Singapore Heritage Festival. And this, today's program is the Amateur Journey Through Radio. Yes. So today, uh, our speaker is Mr. Roland Turner, and I'll give you a brief bio about him before he starts. Okay. So just uh, some housekeeping matters. Please remember to switch your uh, mobile devices to a beeping or silent mode, so that you won't interrupt. Uh, and then there'll be a Q&A session afterwards. Okay. Yeah. So uh, about our speaker for today, uh, Mr. Roland Turner wants to live in a world where creating technology is seen as a form of recreation and expression in addition to its more usual function as well to earn a living. So he's a founding member of Hackerspace SG, co-organizer of Four Stages Annual Open Technology Summit, advisor and mentor to multiple startups at JFDI, and also a lab director at Trustfield, where he develops new applications of the technologies of the company's technology. He learned to solder at age 7, built his first radio transmitter at age 10, and discovered amateur radio at age 14. He's an Australian who has lived in Singapore for the past 8 years, who when not living, eating and breathing uh, technology, is also an avid dancer and runner. <laughs> Not sure I expected that to be read out, but there you go. Um, so, hi, thank you. I'm slightly fewer than I perhaps expected, even allowing for a Sunday afternoon, so appreciate you coming out. Um, the several words on this slide I feel need some clarification, uh, particularly including the words Singapore heritage. You'll notice that I am not Singaporean. So, the museum um, is doing a joint exhibit, exhibit with MediaCorp, uh, commemorating 80 years of broadcast radio in Singapore. And alongside that, do a number of talks. And there's about five of them spread throughout the, I think it's a month of the, the event. And so the curator for talks decided to cut a bit broader than just broadcast. And so she approached the Amateur Radio Club. And yes, there's a bunch of sort of Singaporean uncles who've been Amateur Radio operators for decades, none of whom were willing to speak. <laughs> so, like, ah, ah. so Pan Pan, who the Heritage Board rep, said to me, well, but you've been involved in radio for a long time, yes, since about like, 10. Uh, would you be willing to speak? I was like, well, yeah, but I'm not Singaporean. He said, that's fine. Would you be willing to talk on a more global basis about sort of amateur radio as heritage? Said, yeah, okay. So that's uh, how it comes to be that I, who've lived here for less than a decade, am speaking as part of a heritage festival. Um, the other bits are amateur radio, and indeed amateur and radio. Now, they all need explanation. Uh, a typical image of amateur radio operators, and it's reasonably accurate, um, is sort of people with a radio at home that they use to communicate from time to time. Uh, and increasingly, they have PCs in the middle of them. But uh, there's also a, well, not so clear in the picture, there's a radio under the monitor, and there's an antenna tuner, and some other bits and pieces. So it's a fairly conventional, contemporary amateur radio station. Uh, I, here's a more light-hearted way of explaining what ham radio is. Uh, not sure about the second and third ones, but the rest are pretty clear. You know, <laughs> okay, we tinker, um, and or granddad playing with old person radio again. Uh, some amateurs take themselves a bit too seriously, and in reality it's a bunch of guys, and sometimes women, uh, playing with radios. Um, this is RDA's definition of the amateur service. Um, the idea that it's for self-training communication uh, for people who are interested in radio, and importantly, without pecuniary interest. So the line that they're drawing, and the line that, and most English-speaking jurisdictions use almost the same words. The line that they're drawing is actually about whether you're making money doing it. And that's not the only way of thinking about it, but that's the, the starting point. Um, in terms of what it is, there are, if for devices which intentionally emit a signal, uh, I will be sharing the slides shortly. <laughs> it's, 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 there's a, I, I have, they haven't gone online yet, but the URL will appear at the end of the, the thing, so you, you're welcome to, to photograph as you go, but it, I will be sharing the slides. So. Um, so setting aside interference cases like uh, car engines and electric toothbrushes and, and drills that create interference, if you are transmitting a signal deliberately, there's a whole category of devices where that's okay and you don't need a license. They're generally very low power devices. So Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, wireless microphones, garage door controllers, uh, radio control car type stuff. The, these are generally the industrial scientific and medical bands. And yes, what, what characterizes these is very low power. For those who have to be licensed, broadly speaking, four groups. Broadcasters, who were the first, or some not quite the first, almost the first. Um, Mobile network operators are a really big user now. They have hundreds of transmitters in most cities. Uh, the mobile, sorry, the, the marine aeronautical and land mobile systems, so like security guards with walkie-talkies, sometimes they're license-free, sometimes they're, they're licensed. But these are 
people for whom mobile is or may not be the, the best option. And then finally, the amateurs. The big part of what's different for amateurs is none of these other classes of license allows individual fiddling with the equipment. There's engineering and then there's review. If you set up a network of mobile stations in Singapore or anywhere, um, you get your license, you assemble your station, you then have an inspection, and then you get to turn it on. For amateurs, there's no inspection, and it's the, it's the only category for whom people can make their own gear and not have it inspected before they start transmitting. Um, but it's sort of big, this is sort of what it is, but why? What, why do amateur radio at all? And as far as I can tell, there are four uh, interesting reasons for doing amateur radio. The one that particularly interests me is going places where the, oops, I beg your pardon, operate when the mobile network goes away. We always just assume the network will work, but if you've lived recently in Haiti, Nepal, or a few years ago in Louisiana, uh, you've got to discover that, that isn't true. And it can be untrue for places where there are millions of people. And so for a period of, and where everything fails simultaneously. So yes, we should fix the mobile network immediately, but we should also fix the roads immediately and fix the power network immediately, and also get rid of the floodwaters immediately. You, you can't do everything at once. And so there are a number of places where amateurs operate as emergency relief, uh, where they are either capable of things that formal emergency services can't do, or they function as excess capacity uh, to fill gaps where people are busy doing other things. Um, operating in places where the network doesn't exist, and that's perhaps more of my interest, the big one is space. Uh, but also, for example, in Australia and the US, very large areas of desert and moderate areas of uh, rural settlement where it's just not profitable for mobile network operators to build out networks of towers. And so these are two major areas where mobile, where amateur is used specifically because mobile networks don't exist in the areas where people wish to communicate. Uh, the DIY piece is also important to me and to some amateurs, the, the ability to assemble the electronics to make a radio or to modify it. Uh, and then finally, high power operation. So in principle, and with a whole lot of qualifiers and quite a bit of good luck, uh, it's possible for an amateur here in Singapore operating under the standard rules, with the 300 watt HF transmitter, a good antenna and a lot of luck, to talk to an amateur operating similarly equipped on the other side of the world, which as far as I can tell is about Ecuador. And that, that's using the ionosphere as a duct. And one or two ocean skips. It's not reliable, it's a bit of an art, but it, it does actually work. The key is it requires a lot of power. And that has a safety consequence. If you don't know what you're doing, you'll injure yourselves and your neighbors. And so again, that, so to so become an amateur, you have to pass exams, not just on regulations, but also on radio theory, electronic theory, and related disciplines. You've got to prove that you know this stuff before you are permitted to start doing it. Um, so this is sort of why. Uh, the question is, what do amateurs do? And the answer to that question is actually extremely broad because it's whatever it is that interests an amateur personally. They're not doing it for an employer. And so the, the range is huge. This is not the whole list. This was the, the 15 things that, I, that struck me as somewhat interesting of the dozens that I found when I went looking. Public service I mentioned. Um, it also comes up for sporting events in areas where there's thin mobile coverage. So again, in rural and desert areas in Australia and the US in particular, where people are doing long distance cycling or running where there is no mobile coverage. Amateurs fill gaps. Uh, amateurs compete in call handling. There are literally competitions in how quickly amateurs can contact each other and how many. And so it's, you do several days of the year, there are competitions running, usually on weekends, and amateurs are racking up hundreds or thousands of calls in that time on many different frequencies with people in different locations and using different modes. And this is a, a sort of a uh, training for public service type operation. If, if you've got a, a body of amateurs who are really good at moving messages fast, then when you get into uh, either a planned or emergency public service context, you've got a body of people who are capable operators. DX is distance operation, so I mentioned the, the use of the ionosphere as a duct. That's the sort of traditional amateur hobby, not one that interests me personally, but it's a very popular uh, part of amateur radio. And, and popular here in Singapore, actually, for those the fairly small number of amateurs who are licensed here, more than half are high-frequency DX guys. Uh, repeaters, so handheld radios, which look like walkie-talkies, aren't very powerful and have terrible coverage in urban areas, so it's common to put up uh, on a high location a transmitter and receiver together that will receive from one and talk to, and receive, transfer to the other. So you can actually, a bit like mobile phones, you can talk to each other even if your radios can't see each other. Uh, we have one in Singapore. Satellite interests me in particular. Uh, this is repeaters, but it's repeaters mounted on a spacecraft that's orbiting the Earth at some speed. Uh, this is just technically tricky and it's also kind of awesome. Um, 
I won't get into why it's not a technical talk, but it's the fact that you can do it and that there are amateur satellites and there have been since the dawn of the space age. It's not a new thing, uh, is fairly exciting. Uh, low power operation, so take the distance guys, uh, but take away the power. There are people doing 1,000 kilometer, 2,000 kilometer communications on a regular basis using less than five watts. So this is some high-end digital signal processing and some very clever work with the radio, but proving not how far they can talk with an unlimited amount of power, but how little power they can use to communicate over a certain distance. So it's a technical challenge more than anything else. Um, combining space and low power, moon bounce, or Earth, moon, Earth. This is as crazy as it sounds. This is using the moon itself as a passive reflector. It's tough. The amount of power that can be used is relatively limited, and so you, what comes back is a hundred trillionth of what you send. Losses in free space because of a spherical emission, and then another 90% gets lost in reflecting off the moon, and then another uh, million, I think, nine millionth only comes back. So you end up with this very tiny fraction of the signal that you send. And so this is a weak signal mode to end all weak signal modes. It's technically extremely difficult to do. It's generally not attempted in urban areas. And so part of the reason I want to do it is that, it's, that Singapore is a tough place to do it. Um, high altitude ballooning. People, and in fact including some of the polytechs here, for a variety of different reasons, put stuff onto the edge of space using weather balloons, typically cameras. One of the problems is recovery. The best place to do high altitude ballooning is over a desert, where there's nothing to fall on when you, the thing comes back, and where you can recover it. Doing it over a jungle is not very useful because your odds of ever recovering it aren't very good. The problem is exactly the places that are ideal for high altitude ballooning are the same places where there's no mobile coverage. So if you're trying, if you're depending upon the mobile network as your means of having your object communicate with you and tell you where it is while it's plummeting back to Earth at, at enormous speed, uh, there's a good chance you won't know, you won't find it. So a good number of amateurs get involved in attaching amateur radio transmitters to these devices and then tracking on the ground as it goes up and as it comes down, meaning that the odds of recovery are dramatically increased, sort of 99% likelihood of recovery, so long as it doesn't fall into a, a river or something similar. Uh, meteor scatter, this is a weak signal mode that I, I get the fascination, but I don't think I'll ever try it. When a meteor enters the ionosphere, so the, the, the sort of 60 to 1,000 kilometers above the Earth is a layer of ionized gas or plasma. When a meteor passes through it, it leaves a trail of disturbed ionized gas behind it, which happens to be an effective reflector for radio. For about 30 seconds, it's not there for long. And so there are amateurs that use this as a means of, of bouncing uh, radio signals between two communicating amateurs at great distances across an, across an ocean, for example. Uh, less difficult is aircraft bounce. Um, so using the fuselage and the wings of an aircraft as a reflector, um, it's, the trajectory is predictable. They're much, they're considerably lower, yeah, they're considerably lower, which means that the total communication distance is reduced. It's limited to about 1,000 kilometers, much above that, and you, you, the curvature of the Earth gets in the way. But planes move slowly and in predictable paths. And fortunately, by the time the radio signal reaches the plane, it's so weak that it doesn't affect the plane systems at all. Um, direction finding and fox hunting. So this is an outdoor game, typically you know, during an event. Maybe do one for Make a Fair, not sure. We've got a transmitter hitting, either hiding or indeed hiding and running away, and then a bunch of people with receivers who are chasing the fox and who are basically pointing an antenna to work out and listening to a radio to work out which direction someone's in and then run towards. So it's, it's an outdoor game. And finally, mountain topping. This is uh, popular amongst people who like to hike. Uh, sitting on top of the mountain gives you amazing coverage to uh, large distances. Um, and I'll, I have done that once. So I'll be using amateurs in two, the term amateur in two different ways today. Um, one is the licensed operator. So this is my license from IDA. Um, we now have to renew them only every five years, thankfully. Uh, <laughs> they were annual. Um, nothing very exciting on it other than uh, the class of license and interestingly, the call sign. So amateurs are obliged to use call signs that are structured under an ITU, ITU treaty that start with a national prefix. For Singapore, it's 9V. The same prefix is used for aircraft. If you look at the tail of an SQ aircraft. They always say 9V dash something. Uh, there's always a digit. Singapore isn't big enough to cut into 10 divisions, so it's always one. And then uh, letters for the individual licensee, RT is me. The other, the other way I'm talking about amateur, though, is not 
that they're licensed, but that they are they have some involvement in what they're doing that's not quite the sort of uh, full-time employment. So a lot of it's weekend tinkering, but some of it is full-time. A lot of it is unrelated to their profession, but for some people it is. Certainly for me it is. I, I work on work in software rather than networks, rather than radio, but there's a large overlap. Um, a good fraction of this, what I'll talk about today, is more citizen scientists than radio per se, but actually there's also a category of people who you would describe as independent scientists. They actually are producing professional work, but they're not being employed by anybody. They're, they're self-supporting. And it's, it's the, broadly, the, uh, these different approaches to what they're doing that give rise to what I, the argument I'll make. And so the, mm -hmm. this second meaning then is a talk about people who are doing what they're doing for the love of it, rather than because someone is handing them a paycheck. And so it's the, the, motiv the difference is, is that the motivations tend to be personal. There's stuff that an individual amateur finds interesting or is relevant to their friends or neighbours, rather than the somewhat diffuse things that we do for an employer whose customers we may never meet. So it's a, a different way of thinking about the reason for doing certain kinds of things, and I argue that this will have an effect on uh, what people achieve. So the other thing I need to talk about was radio, uh, and in particular, electromagnetic spectrum. This is not a technical term, a technical talk rather, so the big hairy technical term I'll try and get past as fast as I can. Um, it's not that unfamiliar. If you've ever adjusted a radio dial, you've dealt with EM spectrum already. Those digits aren't arbitrary. They're telling you the, the frequency of oscillation or vibration, if you like, of the radio waves that the radio station is using to send the signal you're listening to. In this case, it's 102.3 megahertz or 102,300,000 cycles per second. That's all it is. So if you now expand the spectrum a bit, the 100 megahertz is about here, and the wavelength is about three meters, a bit bigger than a human body. Um, the same spectrum covers microwave, infrared, optical, ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma radiation. They're all the same thing. They're all oscillating or vibrating magnetic fields. There is no other difference. It's just what frequency. The relevance to what I'm going to talk about today is the electronics gets harder as the frequency goes up. And for that reason, our radio started near the bottom of this spectrum and slowly moved up. And this affected the development of amateur radio. Um, so I'm going to talk about three things, and I'm concerned that we're already behind schedule, but let's carry on. Um, a bit about my own experience, um, and that turns out to be a fairly small part of the talk, but it's why I'm interested. Uh, the heritage angle. So I, I wrote the abstract for the website with a sort of footnote, and I will look into the heritage angle. And so that's what I have, a, I have an argument around heritage that's not perhaps the one that anyone would expect, but it's that amateur radio is much more important than it looks. Um, and I'll do a sort of quick whistle-stop tour through 120 years, sort of one innovation per, cent per decade that was initiated by amateurs, not by professionals. Uh, the first decade of last century. It's okay. That's right. It's blank. <laughs> Apart from the bit at the top. <laughs> I, have, I have more pictures. It's okay. I have, in fact, 45 more pictures. Um, so <laughs> you have to move fairly quickly. The first decade was a bit of a free-for-all. Marconi had an effective monopoly on commercial radio equipment. So he had very little reason to innovate. Worse, he was leasing the gear. He wasn't selling it. So his customers couldn't improve it. So radio, at least commercial radio, was more or less frozen at the stuff Marconi invented in the late 19th century with minor, gradual, sort of incremental innovations. But interestingly, amateurs were already making their own gear and actually had gear that was better frequency, better frequency stability, greater sensitivity, greater selectivity, all the things that make, makes radio better able to be controlled or give it better qualities and better characteristics to solve certain problems, amateurs were actually ahead and quite a long way ahead because Marconi had what he needed. He had a Morse code network to send to telegraphy via radio instead of by wires. That's, that was really commercial he cared about at that point. He, he was himself an a, a, a enthusiastic experimenter, did a lot with amateurs, but his business interests were not uh, advanced in any way by refining the radio. Um, there was a problem though, and it's very similar to the one that we see today with a whole lot of stuff online. It was the first experience that most people had of being able to communicate anonymously. 
And so there was stuff that we would now call trolling going on. Not of women and people of ethnic minorities, but of navies. <laughs> that gets people's attention, right? Like military ships at sea were being interfered with by sort of misbehaving amateurs. That was starting to create a lot of tension. Uh, perhaps the community would have self regulated, perhaps not, but then this happened. And if you've just double taked, please read, or if you didn't, please read the headline again. That's not what happened. Yeah. Multiple media organizations got this wrong at the time and announced that. Needless to say, they were horribly embarrassed when they discovered that that was not true. Haven't been able to get a clear picture, and I suspect no one ever will, of what actually happened, but media organizations needed a scapegoat and they needed one in a hurry. And so the quickest thing to do was to blame amateurs who'd been involved in relaying messages. So now you had a problem. You had a lot of growing irritation about serious misbehavior by amateurs, and you now had a, the blame for, not for much for causing deaths, because that happened anyway, but for a massive miscommunication that caused a scandal. And so in 1912, the US Congress passed the Radio Act to clean up the airwaves and banished the amateurs to frequencies above 1.5 megahertz. Um, you heard that right, a hundredth of the frequency, which we now have, amateur radio, we now have FM radio. They were considered useless frequencies at the time. And so the, ex the assumption appears to have been that amateurs would get bored and go away. This was easier than saying no. So, yeah, you can still operate, but you have to be out of the way of the military and, and commercial traffic. So you, you can have everything above 1.5 megahertz, which we can't use. Then World War I happened. And there's not a lot of uh, visible innovation by anyone at that point other than it's war related. After the war, uh, Marconi, you know, he, he was progressing and so he did this uh, famous demonstration broadcast in London with Dame Nellie Melba, you know, an Australian opera singer. The English government was very concerned about the mess that had happened in the US and didn't wish to repeat it and so they dragged their heels for two years. Finally it was becoming irresistible and so they they granted a license to a consortium of manufacturers, a monopoly license. So instead of having a free-for-all, there's one license, one point of reporting, one interaction with regulators. <laughs> that corporation, or that, uh, that group, still exists. It's called the British, British Broadcasting Corporation. Biggest, oldest, and most famous broadcast in the world. So it sort of looked as though the amateurs were going to disappear. In one of life's very, very strange uh, coincidences, the frequencies just above 1.5 megahertz happen to be the best possible frequencies for long distance communication. The, the, amateur, the bit that amateurs do when they're doing long distance is between 1.6 megahertz and 30 megahertz, roughly the, the, the high frequency or shortwave band. No one could have guessed this. But John Reinhardt was an amateur. He had been experimenting with this and trying things and getting it working, and got to prove it. This is a photo of him sitting in the radio room in a civilian ship that was part of a 1925 uh, Macmillan Arctic expedition. There were also naval ships in the same expedition. And when they were far enough north, the naval communication officers could not communicate. He could, because he'd made a study of HF and atmospheric propagation. He'd worked out techniques that worked, and he had a buddy in the US who had been doing the same thing, and so they were able to keep the expedition in contact when the military operators could not. So, you know, good and bad, this, this proved that HF was useful, proved that amateurs were capable, and that's really important. He was a very active uh, person in the early history of the amateur radio movement in the US. But of course, Marconi was like, oh really? <laughs> and so amateurs now have a, less than 10% of the, the HF spectrum, the rest has all been allocated to, uh, to other uses. Um, there's not much of the story today that I'm going to cover that touches on Singapore, but one of the pieces relates directly to why I'm here, and that's early broadcasting. The original broadcasts in Singapore were not commercial. They were the Malaysian, hang on, get this right, the Amateur Wireless Society of Malaya. Mm -hmm. Between 1925 and 1928, they were broadcasting under license, but not, not a commercial license, from this building. Um, there's a Navigation aid right there. Yes, that's Fulton Bay. This is Collier Key. I believe this is now the Tung something. It's one of the office buildings. 
But yeah, that was one of the taller buildings at the time. It has a little tower on top. And so they stuck their antenna there. They borrowed an aircraft radio, an aircraft air radio, not a ground radio, and used it to do early broadcasting. They proved a number of things to make, to make the point, but the colonial administration was dragging its heels, and for a few reasons. And it took almost a decade before the colonial administration agreed to let a commercial license in the same mould as the BBC license in the UK, which gives rise to the 1936 license that's that we are commemorating this year. There were a couple of amateurs uh, broadcasting individually in addition to the AWSM, and there was a radio vendor, someone who was selling radio receivers, I, as far as I can tell, out of the cafe. <laughs> the same building. And was operating a station there also. And in fact, he had to be taken off air forcibly at the time that the license was granted to uh, BNBC, which is now part of Media Corp. Um, in fact, yeah, that's the... Uh, so this is a, what's called a QSL card, a confirmation of communication card. So broadcasters would encourage their listeners to send reception reports, and from time to time, broadcasters would acknowledge by sending back a, a thank you. This is a card sent by BNBC, the first broadcaster here, in '39, acknowledging the listeners providing a reception report because it was the reception reports that allowed the the broadcaster to be, to be aware that their stuff was working. That, you know, so that was, it was an important part of the process. They, they couldn't use websites or mobile apps to work this stuff out. Right. So jumping forward a little, um, a man working for Bell Labs named Jansky had been looking at this ionospheric propagation problem and interference. And so he built this remarkable instrument. These are tyres of a Model T Ford, <laughs> this is the 1920s, that it's actually an HF antenna for 20 megahertz radio, and it's steerable. And so he was, over a period of months, was marking down where sources of interference were and in which direction they were. And he realised that there were basically three. Storms that were nearby, and he could work out by the fact that he could hear the storm, that he could point the antenna. Things that were obviously storms but were far away, so far away that he couldn't hear them, but they were affecting the atmosphere or the ionosphere somewhere. And then a sort of steady background hiss, whose origin he did not understand. It was cyclical, and it was approximately 24 hours. So, oh, it must be something to do with the sun. Yes. That was the assumption. So he built this thing, and, he, and over about a year's observation, got very clear, in fact, not even the first few months, got very clear data that it was not lined up with the sun. It happened initially that it was lined up with the sun, but over time he was not pointing at the sun anymore, and the cycle was 23 hours and 56 minutes. Are there any astronomers in the room? This period is the sidereal day. If you're looking at something in the sky today, if you look at the same thing in the same position tomorrow, it's four minutes earlier. Yeah. And it's tied up with the fact that we build our time scale around the Earth facing the sun, or during the year, the, the, that, that direction changes. Directly overhead today, and directly overhead at the 8th of November, uh, opposite directions. So you're not quite pointing the same direction. And so that, what that told him was the source of this hiss was outside the solar system. Not just extraterrestrial, but actually outside our solar system. He went to Bell Labs and went, wow, look what I found! <laughs> I want funding to build a 30-meter dish to map this properly. And Bell was like, no, 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 this is not going to help us build our transatlantic telephone system, so we're not funding it. So it got shelved. Well, that would have perhaps been the end of it. Uh, except that this man turned up. This man's an engineer. He heard about Jansky's work and was like, oh my god, that's incredible. I wish to dedicate myself to this. Stranded job interview technique, perhaps. He approached Bell Labs for employment on exactly this basis. And they said, no, no, your economy's a bit tight. Bear in mind, the Great Recession, the, the, the Great Depression was in progress, the, the worst recession the world had ever seen. So Bell wasn't hiring engineers on speculative work. So Reba, he was a he was a ham. So that's his call sign. Um, he did what any reasonable unemployed engineer in the middle of the, world, the worst recession that the world had ever seen would do. <clears throat> he built a three-story high dish in his backyard and set about mapping uh, the radio emissions from the Milky Way. <laughs> really, as far as I can tell, there's nothing even slightly strict about that. He actually did this. And in fact, for 10 years, he was the only radio astronomer in the world. He was publishing. So one of his early results that he published in about 1940 was this. 
And apologies, I didn't quickly find a way to put alongside the Milky Way. But the horizontal line is the plane of the ecliptic, the plane in which the Earth orbits the Sun, and also the Sun orbits the middle of the, the Milky Way. And so when you look at the Milky Way, that horizontal line lines up with the, the center of the Milky Way. Uh, that highest um, contour on the right there is Sagittarius. So it's both the brightest light source in the Milky Way, but also the brightest radio source. And at the time, it was assumed that it was somehow star-related, but couldn't be stars, because if it was, the hiss that Jansky had been receiving would have been quieter than, than the noise from our own sun. We now know it's something called synchrotron light, but that's a, not a discussion for today. Um, he published in about 1940. He was then offered a position at a research institution, and I'm not clear on why he rejected it, but he did. He kept right on with his work, and he kept publishing. Then, of course, World War II happened. He kept going. A couple of other researchers had started to look, but they were working for institutions which had uh, wartime secrecy obligations and therefore couldn't publish. So for a full decade, this was the only radio astronomer in the world, the only publishing one. Post-World War II, astronomy exploded. It, what he had done was proven that it was worthwhile looking at the universe with something other than optical light. That was unthinkable at the time. Astronomy was a, was a visual discipline. He said, no, look, radio. Well, we now know, astronomers, I showed you the EM spectrum, we now have radio, microwave, infrared, uh, optical, ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma astronomy. They're all, like, they're all perfectly normal that we do all these things. We even have two non-electromagnetic astronomy disciplines now, the neutrinos, and as of two months ago, uh, gravitational. Um, but this was not something that astronomers had even begun to think about. And so it was someone operating in an amateur capacity, absolutely determined, academia wouldn't touch it, business had looked at it and shelved it. It took someone operating in his own capacity to go, this is just so awesome, it has to be chased, to give us radio astronomy. Um, then I'll skip the rest of that. So, next example, during World War II. Hedy Lamar is an actress, or was an actress, and reasonably famous one at the time. But she was aware of, I don't know enough about why she had an understanding or, or interest, but was aware of a difficulty with the radio control systems for torpedoes and the risk that they could be jammed. So if you're firing a torpedo at another ship, you can do it passively, just fire and forget and hope it hits the target. Or if you're firing over longer range, you want to be able to steer it. Some use a very long wire, some use radio. If you're using radio and the enemy or the enemy, your target knows what frequency you're using and they can work it out by listening, you're sending a powerful signal, they can jam it. She reasoned, this is a player piano. So it's a piano that has built into it a thing that reads paper rolls, which have songs built in. This is before you could get MP3 players. Um, and you'd load, you'd load the thing up and sort of press the button and, it, and the piano would play. And it's like, aha, so these notes are like different frequencies, like radio. These are mechanical waves rather than electromagnetic. But the insight is valid. She proposed, and in fact patented, um, I forget what she called it, but what we, now, what we now call frequency hopping. It's the basis or the simplest form of spread spectrum. And it's not just useful against someone jamming, it's useful against accidental interference as well. And it's the reason why, with 20 phones in this room right now, half of them with their Wi-Fi and Bluetooth turned on, they're all able to function, because they're all using spread spectrum. Something invented by an actress, not a hammer, not, not a licensed amateur, not an engineer, at the time acting, but then talking to a friend going, oh, this, this, should, this would help. <laughs> These, this keeps happening, and it's sort of my basic argument, is this just keeps happening. There's something about people who are pursuing things that are not necessarily what they're being paid to do that allows categories of thinking and, and exploration to occur that otherwise wouldn't occur. And so all of these sort of profound changes come about exactly because people are outside their professional capacity. I'm going to have to pace it up. Um, Heinz Kaminsky. Ham, like many, has a station set up in his, in his basement. In October 1957, he recorded something. He recorded this. He was the first person outside the Soviet bloc to hear and record Sputnik. That started the space race. 
and it was not professional astronomers, and it was not NASA. NASA didn't exist. It took nine months for the US Congress to go, oh my God, <laughs> we're screwed. And so they passed the Space Act. They, t they upgraded uh, NACA to NASA, uh, gave it special powers to, to, to purchase outside the usual bureaucracy, because damn it, it was a hurry. Those powers still exist, and that will matter later in this presentation. But that was the, that was, once again, it was an amateur who was looking where no one was looking. Obviously, the Soviets knew where it was. They launched it and were watching very closely. But it was a, a, an amateur sitting in West Germany in his basement ham, studio, ham station who was like, huh, <laughs> what's, what's that? I mentioned amateur satellites earlier. Um, this is OSCAR-1, orbiting satellite carrying amateur radio is the, what OSCAR stands for. This went up in December 1961, the same year that both Yuri Gagarin and John, John Glenn, oh dear, it was the first US astronaut in space. The amateurs were in on, on the ground floor. This was guys at one of the contractors who were also at radio amateurs who were like, we could put like radio repeaters up in, the sky, up in space. And so they were, they were hitching rides on CIA funded satellites, really. Um, they put the first voice transponder into orbit. They did the first private communication satellite uh, the first communication satellite built outside the US or the USSR. Australis Oscar 5 was built at the University of Melbourne and launched in January 1970. At this point, I'll sort of divert now to my early involvement. Um, a guy named Dick Smith, also a ham, uh, built a chain of electronic stores, a bit like Radio Shack in the US. And he wrote a book called Dick Smith's Fun Way into Electronics. And I had this at about sort of 9 or 10. I had already learned to solder. Before I, before I got my hands on this. It has 20 circuits in it, no soldering required, including a beer-powered radio. I use lemons. Um, <laughs> but in particular, a transmitter. So this is a paper overlay. You put on a little bit of particle board, and the components were all screwed down and wires, so no soldering at all. This is a working radio. Well, it is once you add the radio transmitter, once you add the components. It's AM band, low power, works over 50 meters. Um, the next big step for me was a thing called Jota. So, so scouts organized jamborees, gigantic camps, uh, once every four years as a way of bringing together scouts from all over the world and to sort of forge in kids this sort of awareness of other people and other cultures. But they're expensive and not many people can get to them. So since, again, about the mid-50s, scouts have run jamboree on the air. And so this is the same idea, but instead of flying to a place and all being the one place, it's radio. It's, again, shortwave or HF radio over long distances. And so for me as a 14-year-old in Sydney, which is a long way from even the next major city is six to eight hours drive away, um, this was pretty amazing. Uh, I don't have any photos from that, but I do recall in particular being very impressed with the mast. We've got very good contrast, but we had to basically put a mast on a, on a farm. We, we camped, it wasn't that scaffold, we went out on a camp, but we had a radio station set up, and yeah, I spent far too many hours uh, talking over great distances. So inspired, in fact, that uh, I was loaned a copy of the, the American, the Amateur Radio Relay League's radio handbook, which as you can see is fairly thick, um, studied its contents, uh, set my exams, and in fact, gained a license. I set the exams when I was about 17, but then got busy with university and other things. Um, didn't get a license until I was sort of 25-ish. And I wanted to do an experiment with, um, anyway, on a mountaintop, I won't get into why. Um, and so, Astonishingly, there's a photograph of it. A photographer was walking around the mountains that day taking photos for his portfolio. He walked up onto the top of this mountain, Australia's third highest, and he's like, what? what? Which is why there's a photo of it at all. Um, but then I began traveling. And so for sort of the succeeding 15, 18 years was never really sort of pinned down. Um, and even when I came to Singapore in about 2007, hadn't expected to stay. And so I didn't wish to accumulate radios and antennas and power supplies and test gear and all the other stuff. So sort of stopped doing anything with radio for a while. So I'll come back to that a bit later. Stepping into, once again, sort of amateur origin innovations. Uh, AMSAT North America, which was the successor project to Oscar, realized that they were incurring so much cost in designing these tiny little satellites that no commercial or military operator was interested in, that they may as well just make a sort of standardized form factor make them modular, and then carry a variety of different payloads in them. This is nine by nine inches by nine inches. And it's got the, the two radios, one VHF, one UHF with different antennas. Uh, that was announced in 89. They put uh, eight of them reached orbit. 
between 1990 and 1996. Great, amateurs looking after themselves. But we now take nanosets for granted. This is what's called a one unit nanoset. It's 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. They're available in two and three unit forms, about the size of a shoebox, a long thin shoebox. Uh, these are launched. So the first, actually, Singapore now has a space office. Uh, the first was for a launch by Microspace Rapid uh, two years ago. Last year, six Singapore satellites were launched out of Delhi. Two of them comm satellites, four of them experimental nanosatellites. But there are hundreds of these things being launched all over the world. These are the successes of what AMSAT North America was doing in the 90s with its microsats. And again, it, it came about because the, the military and telco customers weren't interested in low size, low power, low weight satellites. They had no application for um, Zipping forward to the end of the 90s. So digital had become important to amateurs. And um, it, it, a bit like using the internet, you had sort of email and those kinds of things. But it was beginning to remove amateurs from direct involvement in the radio, the transmit and receive process. And so an amateur, whose name I forget, um, decided to produce a digital mode which was hands-on. So this is like chat except that every character gets transmitted as you do it. There's no error correction, so there are some errors in it. But what's important about it is how much spectrum it uses. We're looking at here less than an amateur voice channel, less than a tenth of a FM broadcast channel. There are five or six strong, oh, sorry, this is a waterfall diagram. The it's left to right is frequency. For the bottom half, it's immediate amplitude. And the top is a sort of historical record that looks like a waterfall. So they, it, if you're seeing it, 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 it's moving down slowly. So what you're seeing is that the last 10 seconds has been strong signals in about eight places, and there's another dozen. These are tiny, maybe 30 hertz wide. There's 600th of the width of a, of a FM broadcast channel, and 2,000th of the width of a TV broadcast channel. This is obviously amateurs doing stuff that's only valuable to amateurs, right? No one could possibly have any use for this. Fun for amateurs who wanted to make you know, a little more hands-on with digital. Except that. We now have a thing called the Internet of Things. We want, Singapore expects, I forget the number, 10, 20 million devices, network connected devices in Singapore within the next decade. They can't all use as much spectrum as a 3G phone. And so here we have an example of a thing that's a, a parking sensor. If you're in an indoor parking lot, you've got sensors built in, that's fine. In an outdoor parking lot, you can't build all that stuff. So you bury this thing, it's half the size of a soft drink can. You bury it just below the surface. It has a battery and it will last for years. And the, a big part of the reason is there's no mobile network. The radio is just off. And every now and then it pops up and transmits a very narrow signal at very low power, much like PSK31. So it was an idea that amateurs were inventing 15, 20 years ago to solve their own problem, and it was obviously useless for any commercial purpose, is now about to change the world. So that's sort of a broad part of my argument. This just keeps happening. But there is a problem. There's a gestation period. These ideas each have about a 10, 15, or 20 year gestation, which means I don't actually have any more examples because we're now too close. And so it's always possible, if I was making this argument at any point in the last 50 years, it would always have been possible to say, but Roland, that was all 15 years ago. There's nothing going on. So OK, maybe this time it's real. It's finally over. <laughs> You'll be unsurprised to hear I don't believe that. Um, however, there's an even worse problem, and I do apologize, this did not get prepared far enough in advance. There is a longer uh, history available. This is the number of active licenses in the United States. And although the, the, the trend to the left is, would be useful, it's just a long, slow growth from about 1970 forwards. And then quite suddenly, in 2002, a few hundred thousand people, uh, so, sorry, big, big, big pardon, 30,000 people, uh, over a three-year period failed to renew the licenses, or there was a deficit of renewals versus new. And it sort of felt like this was broadband internet and smartphones. Right? We're now completely hypnotized with our phones and all of our long-distance communication needs are met, so why would you bother? Yeah. And it's plausible. It just looks like, okay, let's, let's just give the spectrum to telcos and, and move on. But, two things. <laughs> One, this is the Google Trends line for the term maker movement. <laughs> it's on almost exactly the same timing. 
that suddenly this thing has appeared where people are sort of craving building stuff with their own hands in response to their own motivations rather than creating only in a corporate context. It's part of who we are, we're human beings. And so the really, really amazingly good news is this. Oh. And I missed the, there's one more year of data and it went up again. Another 35,000 people uh, became active licensees in the US last year. This is about a quarter of the world's amateurs. About half are in Japan and the other quarter are and scattered all over the place. It happens that, Japan, that the US publishes numbers. Yeah, half are in Japan. <laughs> so, what is going on in Japan? And sadly, most of the website's in Japanese, so I, I really don't have a, a good answer. Um, so, yeah, getting nose at time, but my... I will talk about it. So the, the reason for my becoming licensed again, and this has happened you know, last 18 months, so we're back, back on the, the timeline, a few things. Um, I have a project running that's been a bit idle for a while to map haze movement in Singapore. And one of my problems was getting data back. And I at one point started thinking, huh, radio. I had just become a PR, became a PR 18 months ago. I thought, hmm, it's time. So I did my exams, and as you saw earlier, went to IDA and, and got a license. So I'm now a licensed amateur again. What I'm particularly interested in is space. And a few things. Um, certainly satellite work, and I've done currently receive only, but we'll hopefully get up to transmit before uh, make a fair. Um, one satellite in particular happens to contain people, and that's the ISS. More than half of the astronauts and cosmonauts on board the International Space Station are amateur licensees, and there is an amateur station, not just a repeater, but also a station on board the ISS. We're probably in the wrong place. There's a problem with time zones, but they all work on London time. But it's a... Um, fairly straightforward, and I suspect in this part of the world, not contentious. In the US, it's incredible. Every time they fly over the US during daylight hours, the radio just lights up. So, uh, that's, we'll see. Um, Qatar Telco, Telecom, of all, QTEL of all people, is about to put a geostationary satellite into orbit, because they're a telco, they do that kind of thing. It'll have an amateur transponder on board. This is the first time, I think ever, or, or certainly in a long time, that there's been an amateur transponder on board a geostationary satellite. Geostationaries are most satellites are 100 to 500 kilometers above the ground. Geostationaries are 36,000 kilometers above. And they're important because the time they take to orbit the Earth in a stable orbit is exactly 24 hours, which means they appear to be above the same place in the, on the ground all the time. So anywhere we see a fixed satellite dish, it's pointing at a satellite that's 36,000 kilometers up because the only position where a satellite can appear to be stationary in the sky. So we'll have an amateur, we should have, <laughs> an amateur transponder uh, as soon as January. Uh, yes, but its footprint covers a third of the world. And certainly, I've seen the footprint, it well and truly covers Singapore. Uh, yeah, so it's, for us, it's 40,000 kilometres. It's a, a little bit harder, but it's, we're certainly inside the footprint, and it's not going anywhere. Unlike all the other satellites that run around, all the other amateur satellites. Um, the, long, the longer term objective, however, and I'm sorry I haven't got a picture for it, I mentioned it, was to bounce radio signals off the moon. And mostly because it's tough. It's a very difficult problem. And it... It's little or none of it has ever been done in dense urban environments. There's also a bunch of techniques, I won't bore you with the details today, um, that are in use in contemporary radio and contemporary radio astronomy that amateurs haven't been getting involved in. There are ways to make, and in particular, to make antennas not move. And so we, we now do more, for mobile phones, we do signal processing instead of turning antennas around. And also the transistors for the front ends of the, of the amplifiers have been made cheap because of the needs of telcos. The fact that they're buying millions of these things, or billions of them. So it's there are techniques to try. There's new ground to cover. I don't think it has any commercial use, but who knows. Um, the part of the broader reason for doing it, though, is, and this is part of why I was involved in hackerspace, or am involved in hackerspace. Uh, I would like to be sort of surrounded by people who enjoy playing with technology. And certainly in the hackerspace case, that's been a success. The, we happened to set it up at just the right time, and now there's a community of three, 4,000 people, I think, who are on the Facebook group and about the same on the mailing list. Um, I don't think we'll get to those numbers with amateur radio. Uh, amateur radio requires that you pass a radio communications engineering exam. It's, it's quite a significant investment, as Andy is currently discovering. But certainly to have more than 50, and preferably to have the average age at the club be less than 60, uh, <laughs> would be desirable. Because right now, and this is happening in the US as well, the, the, the club uh, populations are aging, and there's a risk of the hobby dying with it. And I would very much like to prevent that from happening in Singapore if I can. So that's sort of my interest and, and why I do it. I can't give you uh, innovations more recent than 1998 that have had profound 
commercial impact because it's too soon. So instead, I'll give you a few examples of things that people are doing either as radio amateurs or in an amateur capacity that point to two things. One, that there remains, and in fact, is the space in which amateurs can do useful stuff is growing. It's not like, oh, like amateurs last century discovered all the stuff that amateurs could discover, we're done, everything is now done in professional institutions. That's simply not true. And the other is resources. I don't know enough about how Grote Reber did what he did, but he must have had access to money. To build a three-story high dish is hard at any time. To do it in the middle of the, the, the Great Depression. <laughs> so haven't found out how he did that. Uh, so I want to make the point that that is also not a constraint. In fact, again, the reverse is true. So three examples. The first is the Kepler mission. Um, this is a telescope that was launched in 2009. Its brief is fairly simple. Stare at 150,000 stars in a very small piece of the sky and watch for tiny changes in the brightness of the, the star. What they're looking for is planets. This is the planet hunter. If a planet transits in front of a star, take an Earth-sized planet transiting in front of the sun, it will occlude about 1% of the light. So if you're watching the intensity of a star very carefully over a long period, and it has a particular shape dip of about 1% that's about two hours wide, you've spotted a planet. And so that was the purpose of the, the Kepler mission. OK. So NASA has a, the amount of data involved is staggering. Right? If you're watching 150,000 stars for five years, that's a lot of data. NASA has a history of being pretty open with its data. And so it made a very large amount of it available publicly. It had built software that was looking for things that look like planet transits. And you had, mm, I'll skip that story. Um, it, it, so it was filtering the data, finding the stuff it needed. And it found a couple of hundred planets, for 400 planets, in fact. So it, it did what it was supposed to do. But there were some surprises, and it was not NASA that found them. <laughs> this was the first one in 2011. So the things to look at are, this is the brightness, and it's normalized. One means the normal brightness of the star, zero means complete blackness. And this is the mission time in days. Not hours, days. So whatever this event is, it went on for about two days, and it temporarily occluded 15% of the sun's light. Whatever this thing is, it's huge. If this was our solar system, we're talking about something a thousand times the size of the Earth. Uh, can't do a quick way ahead, much larger than Jupiter. Not a thousand times, but, but a, a large multiple of the size of Jupiter. A really big object. Two days. Not an hour or two. Like, huh? <laughs> what, what is this? But worse, and this is, the, this is the really confounding bit, it's not symmetrical. You pass a sphere in front of another, you, you know, this is basic high school trig. Yeah. It, the curve has to be symmetrical. This is real. First thing is, okay, the data's wrong. Because, no, they checked. It's real. It's been confirmed with our instruments. It, this is real. Two years later, however, you, you thought this was a bit odd. Just for the day, so I was like, oh, it's just a, you know, you're being too picky. This happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Couple of days, 20% of the star's light, and not even close to symmetrical. <laughs> Just random. So, and, and the longest, they went, it was 80 days. It was the longest event. So whatever they're looking at, it's not planets, but what on earth? <laughs> what could it possibly be? No, because it's still spherical. Whatever it is, it's not a spherical object, and it's not orbiting, at least not smoothly. Otherwise, and, and it's huge. <laughs> like, what is this? So, uh, yeah, a bit frustrating. Like, we <laughs> found something ab absolutely amazing, and we cannot even guess at what it is. So if you look at the initials of the title, <laughs> where's the, yeah, <laughs> this is the, it's like, we didn't discover this thing, we've checked the data, it's real, and we haven't the faintest idea what it is. Uh, I won't, I will skip the explanation of the second least, like, second least improbable explanation, because it's just too crazy, really sci-fi crazy. Um, but yeah, the best option they've got is, yeah, this is a, a cloud of, of comets, thousands of them somehow doing this non-uniform thing. That's it. That's the best, that's the least improbable theory we've got. And then they get weirder. The point being, it's arguably one of the most important astronomical discoveries in the history of astronomy. And it was not made by professionals. It was made by people acting in an, op in an amateur capacity. So that we haven't run out of important stuff for amateurs to do. The next 
it, this is staggering. Uh, ICE or ICE-3 was a spacecraft launched in the mid-70s. One of the more interesting spacecraft ever. Its initial mission was to sit between the Earth and the Sun. There's a, what's called a Lagrange point where the gravitational pull in both directions is, is about the same. So you can sort of sit there and look at the Sun with a bunch of instruments. Early work on solar wind. It was then repurposed or retasked with a rendezvous with the, I can't even pronounce that, a comet, making it the first spacecraft ever to do so. It was then retasked again to rendezvous with the tail of Halley along with six other spacecraft. It was called the, the Halley Posse, making it the first and only spacecraft to rendezvous with two comets. But okay, by 1987, uh, they had done the final course correction and left it in a sort of orbit around the sun. Um, and it's one that will intersect the Earth at about 20 year intervals. So 1997, stopped talking to it. There's been one or two further um, contacts in between, but by and large, it's, it's space junk. They gifted it to the Smithsonian in orbit. That's the end of the story. <laughs> or it was. <laughs> Until some slightly crazy people um, said, huh, IC3 is coming in with the range of the Earth in 2013. And it's still got fuel in the tank. Wouldn't it be cool to put it back on its original mission? This is not institutional. This is three individuals having a beer. <laughs> Unfortunately, they forgot to stop having this crazy idea. Um, so they set about a reboot project. They approached the Smithsonian, who were like, yeah, sure, but do you have any idea how to do this? No, we have to talk to NASA. Can you write us a letter? So they approached NASA, and NASA was like, sure, but, uh, huh? <laughs> The 1958 Space Act allows, allowed NASA to enter into what's called a non-reimbursable contract. No other government agency can do it. This is a remnant of the Cold War that even made this project possible. It meant that NASA could cooperate, it could provide expertise. The documentation, of course, well, first of the radios had long since been scrapped. The documentation was on yellowing paper in people's garages. It had never been digitized. There was no reason to. But they were able to find enough, A, to talk to the craft, and B, to operate it. So, okay, their problems have really only begun. Uh, fortunately, it's no longer necessary to build radios. This is the 21st century. We now program radios. So they found uh, manufacturers of the, of the highest-end software-defined radios in the world, in fact, two of them, and asked them to become sponsors, and they both agreed to. So they had multiple ground stations, and they had sponsored radios in each case, and they also had help from those organizations in programming the radios to perform the modulation that had been devised in the 70s for this device. They kept stumbling into ITAR problems. Uh, if, international trade and arms regulations, because how to command a spacecraft is considered a munition. Um, you can't just have one ground station. The Earth is spinning, so you need at least three. And so they had one in Arecibo, the world's biggest dish uh, in, in Puerto Rico. It's 300 meters across. Uh, one in Germany, and I forget what the third one was. But they, that was awkward. But okay, they, they had time and they thought about it. Um, the orbital dynamics is a well-understood problem, and one of the three happened to be an engineer whose expertise was orbital dynamics. So he was able to plan the, the mission profile, and the idea was to do a, a slingshot around the moon and to put it back onto an orbit uh, that would put it around this L1 point between Earth and, and the Sun so it could resume its original mission. Um, the third thing you need <laughs> is spacecraft operations. And here things got a bit difficult because finding the documentation took time, and getting up to speed on the, an entire spacecraft system by one guy in eight weeks, a bit tricky. In the context in which the satellite was produced, it was a team of 100 people who had been working on it for five years. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed a step. They didn't have... So, so, so that's the technical problems. But okay, they're amateurs. How do they fund this? Well, so the Smithsonian allowed them to use their craft. The, the radio guys and, and antennas were sponsored. Um, various other things have helped. Uh, they found a disused McDonald's, seriously, in Houston to, to use as their mission control. But okay, they were still needed to incur some costs in travel and in software development and a bunch of other stuff. And so this is the, the, the Groat Reaver question. And I don't yet know how Groat Reaver funded what he did. But one of the objections is, well, we can't do that. Right? We're working people. Where the hell do we get the money to do that? This is the 21st century, and crowdfunding websites have been invented. <laughs> So if you have an awesome project and you think you can't fund it, you aren't thinking hard enough. Um, the other objection here, of course, is 
there really can't be that many satellites or other spacecraft this old that no one's got around to discovering or waking up. In fact, if you'd asked me three weeks ago, I would have agreed with you, and I would have been wrong. 1965, the height of the space race, the US had not established a clear advantage. It launched a series of satellites called the Lincoln Experimental Satellites, about nine of them. The first two were launched in January 1965, half a year before Declaration of Singapore. Its mission completed by 67, and its radio went offline by 69. The, it's believed that the battery went short circuit. The same thing happened to one of the amateur satellites, incidentally. So Oscar 7, the oldest amateur satellite, was offline for 20 years. The short circuit then opened. Well, because you've got a, it's, sure. it's a chemical battery sitting in a radi radiation field. <laughs> Weird stuff's happening to it. So this, this is, Les 1 went, went offline in 1969. In 2013, an amateur, and apologies, I haven't got the sound, found a signal, who like me is interested in satellites, but a bit further along, found a signal that he could not identify. So he worked out the track of the origin, he has a direct antenna, looked up a database of orbiting objects, said, well, that looks like it might be Les 1. But of course, the thing went offline 40-something years ago. The frequency it was using is not known. So he approaches NASA, says, so, NASA. And yes, it's Les 1. The satellite has mysteriously returned to operation. Can't do much with it, it's a beacon. And it's, it's tumbling out of control. And about a four-second interval, and it doesn't have solar panels on the underside. And so every time it turns its backside to the sun, the radio shuts down, and then it comes up again. So you get this sort of ghostly sound that comes and goes. So it's really just an interesting target to spot if you're learning how to point an a satellite antenna and how to automate the tracking. But it's this for a full decade older than IC3 and was discovered at about the same time. Once again, I will guess, and no doubt be wrong, that there are no other 40-plus-year-old spacecraft out there to play with. But you never know. It, it, but more importantly, I would suggest that, that, and we're back to my original thesis, that the areas where amateurs look are exactly the places where others aren't looking. And so the scope for useful stuff to happen hasn't gone away. And so this is not so much get out and do amateur stuff, although I think you should. It's, it's worth recognizing self-directed, self-motivated amateur activity as being as strong a source of innovation as business and uh, academia is. Not that they get the same things, they don't. In fact, the whole point is they don't get the same things, but they need the whole lot. And in societies, Singapore, like every other affluent city in the world, has suddenly noticed that eco economic sustainability is critically dependent upon being a centre of innovation, not just getting access to others. If you're wanting to foster that, that means business, academia and amateurs, not just the first two. Thank you.